Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please stop by and hit that subscribe button. And also make sure that that notification bell is set to all. That way it will remind you of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If anyone is interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found in the description box. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This was one of my most weirdest hiking stories ever. I was in Wisconsin in the summer of 2017 with my buddies on a week-long camping trip for Boy Scouts. It was pretty moderate weather, as it usually is up there in the summer, so we slept in our hammocks with bug nets in a group of trees next to each other away from the rest of our troop. The third night into the trip, we woke up at like 1 o'clock in the morning. At the same time, one of my friends just said, Fuck it, let's go for a hike. And we all agreed. We didn't know the area, but we made sure we knew our way back. We were about 20 minutes into it when we approached a clearing, and right as we did, everything went silent. Wisconsin has so many insects in the summer, and they are very loud. And there was suddenly nothing. The crunching of leaves under our feet was also gone. Then the shadows in the clearing started to look like they were growing and coming towards us and I felt as if we were in danger. We're all track guys, so we absolutely booked it back in about four minutes. None of us slept that night. We came to a consensus that we all saw the shadows coming towards us, had all the sound go out, and felt danger coming. We still speak about that night sometimes when we get high, and it still sends shivers down my spine. I'm very educated in my religion, and I still cannot correlate that to my religion, but I'm currently going over it with a scholar I respect. This shit scared me so much, it was actually scarier than when I found a whole abandoned meth lab that was in Missouri, complete with hacksaws hanging from a tree. I'm obviously late to the party, but I've got several of these stories, some of which I'll toss aside since they occurred in salt marshes, just off very populated areas. When I was six, my family owned a fair bit of land around one of the most popular springs in the area. As soon as my mom or dad came with me, I was free to trot off into the woods. Well, one day, my dad is home, and off we go to fuck about. Mostly, I just ran around burning off my little kid energy, and that's just what I'm doing. The trees aren't dense, probably about 10 feet between them, but there's just a lot of trees, a lot of dead leaves covering the ground, and that haze you get whenever you're deep into the woods. Well, I wind up lost. I'm somewhere on our land I don't recognize. There's trees and leaves far as the eye can see, and the ground is littered in old, rusted wheels, a bed frame, and other various garbage in no particular order. And it had to have been there for quite a while. Being six, I do the logical thing and freak out, starting to cry and screaming for my dad. After a minute of this, I hear him shout, Hold on, don't move. Just keep crying, I'm on my way. 
A few seconds pass, I'm still shouting. And then I hear him say from what I think is a different direction. I'm over here, honey. Follow my voice. A few seconds later, almost there, just hold on. And then again, a few seconds later, I'm right over here, just come here. This goes on for about a minute and I break down even more because to me, he's telling me two separate things and I just curl up and cry. He linebackers his way into view, grabs me by the arm and pulls me up. I'm not hurried away or anything. He just calms me down a bit and then we walk off. I tell him he shouldn't have kept telling me to come to him after saying to stay there. And he tells me he never said that and that if you're lost in the woods near someone else, the best thing to do is stay put so they can find you. It was never brought up again. When I was in middle school, I was friends with a kid who had an unusual house. For starters, it had a basement. This is effectively considered a bad move in the state of Florida. Weirder yet, cell phones didn't work inside his house at all. And the second you step outside to his front porch or side porch, boom, all your signal is back. Anywhere outside, the signal is there. But his place was cool and it was built next to an old, dried up riverbed. It was super fun to play on it since it was all his parents' property. Naturally, we stayed friends throughout high school and his place became the de facto hangout spot for the majority of us, despite the cell phone weirdness. It got significantly creepier. However, once the red eyes started appearing, I have to pause here and fill in this. This was after the breakthrough of the smartphone, but before apps were commonplace on them. And this meant there was no flashlight app or anything of the like. Angry Birds didn't exist, and the attached keyboard was the newest craze, if that tells you anything. You see, his house was literally a couple hundred feet from a major highway, but through just enough trees to dampen the noise of most vehicles. And when most of us had our licenses and started to spend erratic weekends there, the red eyes showed up. They were easily described two evenly spaced, small crimson colored lights that would just appear on the property, often just on the other side of the fence from where we parked and the very edge of where his floodlights reached. They would linger for a few seconds, abruptly go out and then appear elsewhere, usually 10 or so feet away, maybe at a different height. And then, they would do this for apparently random amount of times and eventually just disappear. They were bright enough that I once decided on the spot I was going home in the morning because I got to his front door and saw them staring at the house through the windshield of my car. They made everyone that saw them nervous and fearful. A couple of my buddies bravely went out at night to try and figure out what it was. I did not go with them, and there were four of them. Probably half an hour later, me and someone else are sitting on the porch, getting some fresh air and drinking sodas, when they came screaming out of the woods, and rather than take the set of gates, just jumped the fence entirely. What I was told was that they just got out of sight of the house and been sweeping the area when, as a group, they felt suddenly watched. They heard something rustling through the leaves and a bamboo cluster began to rattle. They swept the light over the area around them to try and see something, but nothing showed up. Suddenly, part of the cluster just bent and broke, so they hightailed it out of there. They finished relaying the story and of course were calling bullshit on them before the guy sitting with me gets us to look out into the woods. There, burning brightly, is the same damned pair of crimson eyes staring at the house. And then they blink out and come back on, heading towards the gates. Naturally, 
We fuck off back inside. We still don't know what caused them, and as a collective, we've seen them probably around a hundred times on and off with different groups of people, so the makeup of people was never quite the same. His dad was adamant it was just the taillights from the road that went through those woods, but we didn't really buy that because we've been to the road. It's a bridge over the gap where the river used to be, and to easily get there, you have to follow the riverbed because the trees and vines are denser than it's worth going around them. Even then, it's a 20-ish minute hike to a large fence the height of the bridge, you have to scale and another couple hundred feet to the bridge itself. There's no fucking way you'd ever see the light of anything that far out, and even if you did, it would be on and off, flickering, not what we saw. The closest answer I've gotten to is, it was an obscured Floridian spirit known as the Red Eyes or Old Red Eye, depending on the tale. Although the details are pretty fuddled and it's considered something that was made up recently, the story, depending on the title, goes that the lights are the eyes of a spirit that was either a Native American, the Red Eyes, or an escaped slave or conductor along the Underground Railroad, Old Red Eye. They were tasked with helping others of their kind escape. Trail of Tears or slavery, and were sort of a lookout for hostile patrolmen in the area, and were, if they encountered them, supposed to lure them away or scare them off the trail that was to be used. A last-ditch effort was to kill them, if necessary. Needless to say, the ghost was one of those people that died doing their duty, and now haunt the area they died in. And if you don't give them the password or safe word or gesture or whatever have you, they get more and more aggressive until eventually they have no choice left but to kill you. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least, as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started, thinning out. So, when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of the secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up and make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up this steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots. Not the excited, oh, you motherfuckers are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here high-pitched barks, but unsure, concerned barks. Now, the day before, I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers just a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement before I went to go hang my bear back up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I start hiking up the steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean again so I didn't go tumbling down before making another five to six step push to the next tree I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making it up this hill or ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about a hundred feet up the hill 
and I hear a whole lot of big movement about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep, low growl to a savage slobber flying everywhere, type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in the matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. And I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off this 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, like hundreds of 5 to 20 feet boulders. So, I'm feeling pretty screwed about right now. Then, I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her into the tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kind of snapped back to it. And I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order and call my dog back to me. Loki, by the way. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree. So I'm kind of pinned and stuck there for a moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there. So I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the lights of whatever is up there. Peering, peering, nothing. But I had just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there. So I'm kind of just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And, you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake or bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet. And I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement. Something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon slash sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out suddenly makes my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes but some raggedy shit with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, almost like a makeshift guile suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So, I stare. For what seemed like minutes, no words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt or risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I started heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave, but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again, 
Just to make it even more clear, I saw him, and eventually I made it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to be barking. Dash hounds do that. Or just barking back at my dog. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow gotten out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling, with her tail sticking straight up. Still trying to hold it together, I thought, okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out. But I was positive I had zipped it, so the zipper tap or openings was at the very top of that tent door, out of reach. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40. I fired a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climbed into my tent without eating and laid down with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my shit and I was leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about four miles from my vehicle. But thankfully, there were other people there. We sat around the fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning. So I tell them my story in great detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day, though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman found murdered just last year. Personal story, this happened to me, my brother and our friends. Not a my sister's uncle's best friend story. I tell 100% truth, make no assumptions. Here are the facts. You make up your own mind as to what happened. I grew up in a small mountain town in Utah, away from civilization, up a canyon. If you walk out my back door and through a 200-yard field, you will come upon a mountain and small wooded area. We always called these the river bottoms for obvious reasons. Summer of 2004, just before I turned 16, our house was the go-to party location. Always clean parties. Lots of people would show up and most nights we would end up having a bonfire in the backyard with guitars and just chill and watch the fire and stars. One night, we decide to start telling ghost stories. One of my close friends lived a mile down the road with his house, the same distance away from the same river bottoms. Discussion turns from the fake ghost stories to real talk about weird things that have happened to us, and my friend quickly takes the attention. He tells two stories. The first was when he was younger, 10 or 11, he says. He wakes up in the middle of the night in the dead of winter and decided to go downstairs for a glass of water. His kitchen sinks face the river bottoms. While drinking, he looks up at the window and sees a man's face looking at him from outside. He drops the glass, it shatters on the floor, and his mom comes in to see what happened. They turn on the porch light and look outside, where there had been fresh snow and there was no man or any footprints. Okay, must have been a reflection, sure. A couple of weeks later, he is outside playing in the snow just after dark 
and his dog starts barking and growling towards the river bottoms. He looks out, can't see anything, but gets a weird feeling in his stomach and starts to go inside. He's about to the back door when he hears his dog behind him yelp. Then he comes running towards him. Again, turns around and can't see anything, runs inside. He finishes this story saying that he has always had this fear of the river bottoms and doesn't like going out there. Naturally, as a bunch of young men with something to prove, a few of my friends decide they are going to go out there and explore. It is nearly a full moon and a clear night, so visibility is pretty good. I think five made the first trip. They leave about 15 or so of us just chilling around the fire for about 10 minutes. Definitely not long enough to really get to the bottoms and explore anything. And they came running back to the fire. A few of them say they saw something out there, which isn't too out of the ordinary. The field between the backyard and the bottoms frequently has cows, and it is really common to see deer, coyotes, or other wildlife in the area. We talked them down and resumed the guitars. One of my older brother's friends is sitting with his back facing the bottoms, has been usually quiet since he got back and keeps turning his head and looking behind him. At six foot five inches and 240 plus pounds, it was very out of character. Eventually, a second group decides to go out. This time, we go inside and gather up flashlights, hockey sticks, baseball bats, whatever we can find, just in case. This time, we have a group of about 10, which includes myself. We get about halfway to the river bottoms when I started to get a really dark feeling. I related to fear, but it was so much more. Just like something was not sitting right. The only time I have had fear like this was when I had a gun pointed at me a couple years ago and had a genuine fear for my life moment. Then we start to hear this faint whistle, almost like you would hear with the wind and in a wooded area, but we weren't in the trees yet. Then we heard it again in a different direction. Then directly behind us, much faster than a person could have ever moved without being seen or heard. We get freaked out and clumped together. We hear the whistle again, and the two with flashlights both zero in on the spot to our left. And what we see for just a fraction of a second is a dark silhouette, maybe three to four feet high and red reflection in the eyes. Then it darts away at insane speeds and we lose it. Knowing that everyone saw this thing, we all made a mad dash for the house. Getting back to the fire, we decided we don't want to stay there any longer. We put out the fire. In typical youth fashion, all the boys stood in a circle and pissed on it until the coals were gone and climbed into the cars and left. About an hour or so later, my brother and I get home. As we're pulling into the driveway, we see the fire in a blaze again. Still feeling creeped out, we go to put it out with the hose and all of the wood that we had in the stack a few feet away have been thrown into the pit. Mega weird. Here's where the story really gets interesting. The next day, we are having Sunday dinner with my parents. This is a quick side story. My dad grew up in the 50s in neighboring house to where we currently live. They asked if we had fun last night, and my brother said, yeah, but I don't know if anyone will be coming back anymore. Why is that? Did you guys see the boogeyman? Yeah, Dad. We saw the boogeyman, chuckled my brother sarcastically. Really, I saw the boogeyman once. I was really little, probably eight or nine. I remember I was really sick and had a fever, but I remember looking out my front door one night, about dusk, and seeing this dark shape next to our mailbox. 
Its head was just below the mailbox, and it was looking at me with glowing red eyes. My brother and I both look at each other like, Did you tell him what happened? And we both knew that he had to have been telling the truth. A few weeks later, we are again having a bonfire at the house when we notice that the river bottoms seem to be glowing a little ways away. We hop in the car and get almost to my friend's house when we see that the bottoms are on fire. We call 911 to report it. It is government land, by the way. And decide to go out and see it for ourselves while waiting for the FD to get there. It wasn't super out of control, and as we get close, we see that it is just the grass burning in a small clearing. We decide that we probably could have even stamped it out. It just looks like a few lines burning in about a 10-foot radius. We get it out, and one of my friends starts walking in a circle, following the burnt ash, and looking towards the middle. He then starts to climb a tree, and as he gets a few feet up, he says, Guys, this is a pentagram. The super weird thing is that it had been burning for at least 20 to 30 minutes before we got out there. But the grass was still burnt in a perfect pentagram. No spreading at all. Yeah, super weird. A few days later, we hear about how there were people arrested a couple of years ago for performing devil worship in the river bottoms. They would regularly burn pentagrams into the ground and slaughter animals in the center. So, over the next year, the story spread through the town, and it becomes this sort of legend. My brother has this mythology class in the spring, and the final project is to create a myth. The teacher, knowing his story, suggests to my brother that he uses this as his story and give it some depth. Greek mythology integrated with real life, my brother gave life to the name of Nephthys Galfin, or Gal for short, about a mortal cursed by Zeus for an affair with Hera, doomed to be a river demon for the rest of time. But the background story is not enough. He decides that he needs evidence. We decide to start the night off the same way we did that first night. Bonfire with about 15 to 20 people, guitars, ghost stories, and then gal stories. We called this the ritual, and it seemed to invite whatever it was. After a couple of hours, we decide it is time. We head towards the bottoms with a video camera, in night mode, by the way. A spotlight. Everyone has their own flashlight. BB guns, you name it. We get about halfway out, and the dark feeling comes back. Again, I really have to stop and stress this feeling. Fear, like you know something wants to die. This time, we don't hear the whistling, but we do hear a rush of something moving quickly and very close. We can't manage to get it in the light or on camera. So, we decide that we have to keep going. We are about 20 yards from the bottoms, and there is a small hill ridge that separates the field from the river. The front person stops moving and asks for the spotlight. He shines it up on the ridge, and standing next to a tree is the black shape. Glowing red eyes, probably four feet tall, looks just like a child wearing a hooded trench coat, but so black that it seems to be made of a black hole. It stays there and stares right back at us. It felt like forever it was there, all of us looking at it. Does everyone see that? With our camera guy just saying, focus, damn it, focus. Then it slowly takes two steps towards the tree disappears behind it and doesn't come out the other side. Screw the project. Screw everyone else. Panic sets in and everyone starts running towards the house. We get to the backyard where we have to cross a barbed wire fence. Our house does have a lot of outdoor lighting. 
so we figured once we cross the fence, we'll be safe. The cameraman is on the field side, still pointed towards the bottoms. When he realized he is the last one on that side of the fence, quick panic and he turns to hop over. We all get inside and after trying to calm down, we decide to look at the footage. We watch everything, trying to see if we caught anything weird on the early part. Nothing. We get to the ridge and the camera just did not want to focus. It faces the ridge, super blurry. He pulls it down, looks at his feet. It would focus, back up, and again blurry. You could hear, it's going behind the tree. And then bam, focus as clear as day. Obviously disappointed, everyone starts up their own conversations. My brother starts the tape over again, from the beginning, and sits right below the TV, just staring at it, not talking. He is pausing, rewinding frame by frame at the blurry part, trying to find something, but none of the footage seems usable. He gets to the point where we are almost back to the house, and my friend, the one from the beginning story, just happened to be watching, and at the end says, hold on, go back. They go really slow, frame by frame again, as the cameraman hops the fence. As he hops, the camera faces slightly into the yard to his left, and standing next to a tree, not even five feet away, is a small black figure with red eyes. In the yard, five feet away from him, less than ten feet away from most of the rest of us. None of us saw it or knew it was there, but we had it on camera. So, back in those days, we had these things called VHS tapes. We put movies on them. My brother and his friend edited the movie and made two copies, one for us, one to turn into his teacher for the project. These tapes both included the footage we shot that night. A couple years later, my brother and I decide we want to watch it, and we cannot find the tape anywhere. We searched the whole house. Nothing. We did not want to fail, so we called up his mythology teacher, who we know had this tape and had even shown it to his classes and asked if we could borrow it to copy it. And, of course, he also seems to have misplaced his copy. To this day, I still don't go in the river bottoms. I don't like to bring up the story when people or family members ask me to tell it because I know that they all think I'm either lying or that it was just youthful fear playing tricks on my mind. I know what I saw, and I know what I felt. It was real. And though I don't know what it was, something decided to come out and torment me and my friends in our teenage years, and I am 100% confident in saying that it wanted to see all of us dead. I'll start this off by saying I grew up completely, 100% adamant that the paranormal isn't real. It can all be rationalized and that people who believed in it haven't thought about it hard enough. I've made other posts on other subs about paranormal events that have happened in my life recently that have completely changed my mind, primarily about my neighbor's house. That's not what I'll be talking about today, though. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest in a camper. I've lived in this county my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to a conclusion that my experiences around the rural and wooded parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of it. I've had many encounters, actually. None back-to-back, -back, but they happen frequently. 
There is a forest and park in the middle of town I always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousin and I thought getting scared was actually really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but never lasted long. I always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of the urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago. I got married and am settling into life as a husband. I'd take my large, all-black German shepherd, Finn is his name, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter into it. The first time something weird happened was five years ago. I was walking Finn in the woods to the front and to the right of me. To the left and behind me was a neighborhood edge and a small playground. Went silent. My dog started acting super anxious. He's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank. Looks very intimidating and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods following me, and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home, and that's the end of the first encounter. I had a few more encounters like that, but last year, things really amped up. I was on a walk at around 11.30 p.m. with Finn, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier Chimex. We are walking down the same path and about three blocks away from the woods, four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street towards us, and they seem terrified. Then I hear what I can only describe as what sounded like a human trying to mimic the sounds of a monkey. I thought it was silly until recently. I had read that other guy's story who heard this same fucking thing. We laughed it off as some kids playing around. Once we got up to the woods and are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhouette staring at us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl and then like a hissing sound, but it wasn't super high pitched or anything. Both of our dogs acknowledged this as well. Finn started and Booger growled a bit. I made a Facebook post on the community's Facebook group, and other people had similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide and maintenance for rail explorers. I am working there again this year as well. We start April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used federally, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them. You can use to explore the tracks. It's super cool and super fun. The one I work at is like five minutes from where I live and it goes through the woods in an inaccessible part of the county unless you float down the river and hike up those steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge and you go over two multi-hundred foot length old train bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground, above the forest. The second goes over the river, about six months into the job, and it's fall. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving at about 9 p.m. That means the last tour for the last two months of the year are in complete darkness. The way that job operates is with six employees. Four get on the lead bike and two get on the rear bike. From the lead bike, we dropped off one person at the busy intersection so they can flag traffic. And one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. The person at the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands we use so the customers can see us and light up safety vests. 
On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes. Instead of leaving the depot at sunset, we were leaving at dusk. I was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black aside from the stars providing a little light. My co-workers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to that first cart of four. I chatted with them a bit. I was trying to buy some time and wait for the next customer cart, so there wasn't a massive gap for my co-workers, who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave, and I was alone. I was alone for... I would say 20 minutes. I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. One of the only times we've ever had an issue like that. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on above my head, so everyone and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit. I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin moving quickly. But right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer cart coming close. So I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed that they had a little boy with them and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point, but have to act appropriate, even more so because of this little boy. I do not want to scare him any more than he already is. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus fucking Christ, and spin around with my flashlight on instinct. Poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer and they are good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection. This isn't like an in-town intersection, it's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He's Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in that cornfield and Whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him to come into that field. He was also without communication for those 20 minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and could see a lot better than me. Another time, me and that same coworker were headed back on the front cart. We were away ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, I am a bit afraid of heights, and this bridge has massive gaps between the planks you could fit through, but after doing it so often, you just get used to it. It was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and having small talk. Then, it goes silent. We are a hundred and so feet in the air, above the woods. We can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear what sounds like a human mimicking a monkey noise, and we hear growling. He looks at me, completely serious, and tells me in a stern tone that we need to get out of here right now. I drove the fuck out of there, and he moved state to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there, and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers have at least one story. I'm only sharing mine because I have to tell someone. A few months go by, and it's late fall. Around the middle of November, I drive through the park in town a lot when I was just wanting to go for a drive. I had my dog, Finn, with me, and it's around 2 a.m., I can't sleep, so I'm listening to a Melvin's CD and started leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates, I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear. It's beyond fight or flight. 
I have never felt that way in my entire life anywhere else, ever. And I feel it every time I'm there. I'm driving through the park and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Ben can still poke his head out, but can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around because I'm already past the halfway point. Turning around would make me stay in the woods longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns. I couldn't see around. I round the last corner and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid. Tall and lanky, not quite human. Fucking crawling on its hands and feet, but it was crawling fast as hell. 20 miles per hour type shit. We don't have bears here. The only animal that size are large humans and deer. That was not a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Finn saw it too. He doesn't bark at animals, not even other dogs. He went ballistic. He was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer and I've raised him since birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Finn. I'll never do it again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew right by my head, so close I could have smacked it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I get into the park, I feel extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only streetlight in the entire park and I turn around and face the woods. Me and Finn stand there, frozen, for like 10 minutes. The silence was deafening. Anytime I heard anything, I jumped. Finn was anxious as hell too. He kept staring into a certain spot in the woods a ways off. I swear I saw eyes in there every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. It'll be interesting to see what happens at my job this year. I wanted to also add that the county that I lived in is packed full of abandoned mines. Hundreds of them. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwood creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Innerscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for remaining the pillars on which BTA stands. And for the other subscribers and the audience, thank you so much. Back to Ashes would not be here if it weren't for you. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Summerland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.